Kirk, thank you very much for joining us today. According to the WNA, Urenco is the world's second largest enricher, comprising approximately 30% of uh, global market share. And I'm just curious how Urenco is responding to this changing nuclear energy environment. Well, enrichment services are a manufactured product, and so we're well prepared to expand to meet the expanded use of nuclear power. It's something that we've done before, and we are prepared to do it again. We are embarked on a project to increase our global staff by about 25% this year to help us manage what we expect will be significant growth. We've also made some new contracts with our uh, centrifuge supplier, Enrichment Technology Company, in order to ensure critical supply chains. Uh, we just announced our first expansion uh, in the U.S., uh, a, a fairly modest uh, 700,000 SWU per year that will be uh, in place in early 2027. We're also looking at uh, the market's demand for advanced fuels. These are fuels with enrichments that are higher than 5% U-235. As a first stage to address this demand, we are about to submit a license amendment to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission to relicense our entire U.S. facility to produce up to 10 weight percent U-235. We're also uh, deeply uh, involved in the design of what we call a high assay LEU module. This will be a site within our existing site that is dedicated to the production of up to 20% U-235. And we're working very closely with reactor vendors on uh, their demand for high assay LEU, as well as involved in the DOE, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy's request for proposals for high assay LEU. And when you said that increased capacity in the U.S. is going to come on in 2027, I'm surprised it would take so long. Why is that? That's not actually that long in, in terms of nuclear build-out. Uh, we'll begin the uh, expansion in 2025 and uh, progress it all the way through the beginning of 2027. Uh, Urenco's technology is modular and expandable, so we don't need to uh, wait until we're finished installing new machinery. As we install it, we can start it in production. Uh, so it will ramp up in a linear fashion. All aspects of the fuel cycle have seen significant price increases in the past year. Maybe you can just speak to what you and your team are seeing at your Uranco from enrichment prices. Sure. Um, we're seeing a real renewed emphasis on the security of supply from our customers. Uh, the uh, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has really uh, shaken uh, the faith in uh, what, what uh, can be fairly characterized as the world's largest nuclear fuel supplier. And uh, there is a flight to uh, safety uh, in terms of contracting with what is seen as secure, sustainable partners for fuel supply. And in addition to the higher prices from enrichment services, what other aspects of the contracting, enrichment contracting, are you seeing? We're uh, particularly, uh, we're seeing in request for proposal the words non-Russian, which means that the prices that are being reached in today's market are those that reflect sustainable Western supply. Um, so we're seeing uh, those level of prices as well as much longer delivery terms and contracts. Uh, we have uh, increased uh, our order book uh, from the end of 2021, just before the start of uh, the war in Ukraine, from a level of 8.7 billion euros to uh, at the end of the half year this year to 12 billion euros. And we have now commitments that extend through 2045. So it really highlights uh, the uh, renewed emphasis on security of long-term supply for our customers. In terms of pricing, we've seen significant moves in both conversion and enrichment here in the past year, two years. Not so much in the spot price, and many market pundits say that is because the fuel buyers are more focused on conversion and enrichment. Would you agree with that? Well, I don't know. It's a good question for fuel buyers in particular. My observation is uh, along the lines of their focus on long-term security of supply. Uh, neither the conversion or enrichment market are particularly liquid. So the practice has always been on midterm or long-term supplies. 
uranium market is much more fluid, and so there has been a reliance on spot purchases uh, in certain customers' portfolios. I think today uh, that uh, customers are looking for long-term sustainable partners in all components of the fuel cycle, including uranium. So they're not purchasing less uranium, but they're probably purchasing uranium under different uh, contract conditions. Are utilities in one region of the world more aggressive in acquiring enrichment services than other regions? Well, uh, it's a good question. I, I think all uh, nuclear companies are concerned about security of supply, and increasingly the governments where they operate are also uh, concerned about security of supply. Um, I think there is some regional uh, uh, differences that we can observe. For instance, in those countries that operate Russian-designed VVER reactors, also happen to be in countries that have been affected by disruptions in other kinds of Russian energy supplies. Uh, we can see that reflected in their procurement strategies, which is a rapid diversification away from what has been exclusively Rosatom supplies to those uh, utilities. In the United States, which is Urenko's largest market, uh, the imports of Russian fuel is already limited by the Russian suspension agreement. However, there is a lot of noise and discussion about potential legislation that would reduce those import limits even further. And that has had an impact on procurement practices in the United States and the pace of procurement. And Kirk, maybe you can just add a little bit more context as to what the limits are associated with that Russian suspension agreement? Sure. It's, a, it's an agreement between the governments of the United States and the governments of Russia based on an anti-dumping complaint that dates back uh, more than 40 years. Uh, the current version of this agreement limits uh, Russian imports to the U.S. by year. And uh, currently, I believe the limit in 2023 is 24% of the U.S. market. But that declines to 15% in 2028, all the way through 2040. You are adding capacity in the U.S., but what will it take for Urenco to add further capacity across all of its facilities or increase capacity? It's a great question. Uh, Urenco is a, quite a conservative company. Uh, we're very much a nuclear company focused on safety and our reputation for 100% reliability of delivery. Um, in that vein, we don't install speculative capacity. We only install capacity to the extent it's necessary to serve long-term contract demand. So that's the first ingredient we're looking for. Long-term contracts that are sustainably priced will underpin investments in new capacity. The second thing we're looking for is some indication from governments that there will not be a future flood of Russian fuel supply into Western markets. As you know, uh, Russia itself is an inaccessible market to third parties. So it's a one-way flow of material from Russia to the West. And we have had the experience of stranding investments uh, to get a significant uh, economic uh, hit to our bottom lines. And we want to avoid that situation in the future. Kirk, you have been coming to many symposiums over the years. And I'm just curious to hear your views on how this one is different, just in terms of its tone toward nuclear energy. I think there's two words that sum it up. Abundant optimism. Uh, that is a sense that pervades, I think, every single delegate here. Uh, there is an enthusiasm for the renewed use of nuclear power around the world. There is an abundance of really, really bright people working on new nuclear technologies. And I think that has absolutely influenced the front end of the fuel cycle in terms of uranium exploration, uh, restart of conversion facilities, and of course, expansion of enrichment facilities. Well, Kirk, thank you very much for providing that overview of Urenco and its enrichment business. Once again, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.